Hello everyone, welcome to our programming homework. In here we will create four player controlling script that will allow our character to rotate, move around, shoot bullets, and die when impacted by enemies. Let's quickly take a look at what it will look like in the end. Before we actually start working on the game, we should download the files from this URL. Like before, you can copy the code uh, into your GitHub desktop, or you can download the zip file. Either way, uh, open it up with your Unity. The link for this will be in the description. Now that we're here, let's quickly look into our scripts folder. You will find that there are eight scripts. We will be working on four of them. All of them have the prefix of player. We have player die, player move, player rotation, and player shoot. Uh, let's also take a look at our level. You will notice these red bars around it. These are to destroy any enemy objects that leave the screen. There's four dots. These dots are going to be used to spawn enemy objects. So there will be enemies spawning from this side going right. There will be enemies spawning from the top going down. They're going to be on this side spawning left and likewise from down up. We also have white lines. These are going to be our box colliders that create the barrier for the game's world. And we also have a canvas. The canvas has a score that will keep track of how many enemies you defeated and it has an end game screen that, that will reset the level upon the player death. Here you will see that it, there's our player. Our player has a couple components already attached. They have a polygon collider that allows them to have that shape and it has a rigid body that we'll be using to move around. It has a child that's the sprite. It keeps the shape of the player and it has a Another child that's a spawn point. This is where the bullets will come from. If we play if we play the game right now, you will see that all the enemies spawn. However, you are not able to move or interact with the game in any ways. So let's mitigate that and start by working on our player movement. So we are creating our player movement. One of the first things we want to do is have access to our rigid body so we can affect its velocity. So let's grab a rigid body. Make sure that it's a 2D rigid body. Let's name it rigid body 2D. Put an underscore uh, to signify that it's a private object. And let's connect it. We're going to do private void start. And in our start function, we're going to connect our rigid body. So like so, we are going to connect the component because this will be directly attached to the player object, which has the rigid body component also attached to it. Next. We will want to next we will want to update the rigid body. To do that, we will also have to have velocities that we want to keep track of. So let's create two variables. We'll do private float x speed. We'll do private float y speed. And we will save our input values into these variables. To do this, we're gonna create our update function. And we're gonna do x speed equals input that get axis parentheses horizontal what this is doing is if we open up our project settings we can go to we can go to input manager and you will see that axis horizontal is connected to left right buttons a and d buttons and it will read those as inputs so if a player clicks a they will receive minus one as the value of x if they click D, they will receive one as the value of X speed. And if you don't click anything, it will register as zero. Likewise, we will do that for our Y speed. Except we can copy and paste, except for horizontal, we will do vertical. Now, what we want to do is we want to save these values into our rigid body. So we're going to get our rigid body. We're going to get our velocity and we're going to create a new vector with the values of x and y. As we said, this will only control the speed of minus one, zero, and one. That would be pretty slow for our player. So what we can do is we can create one more variable, public float, and we can call it speed. Let's give it a base value of three, and we can multiply these by our speed so that whatever value you decide should be the speed of the player will be here. One last thing before we move on, having these hard-coded values can be a problem. 
for whatever case, you may want to change what this is. And if you use this across your code multiple times, you will have to change it in every instance. So the best thing to do is have our variables identified at the top. So let's do private string input x equals horizontal. And we're going to do the same thing for our vertical input y. And we're going to replace these so that if we ever need to use horizontal or vertical, we can just use this variable instead of having to type it and hard coding it. Let's test out our game now. First thing we will have to do is connect the script. So let's drag it into our player. As you can see, our public variable is here and you can adjust it at any time. So our player can dodge the enemies. However, we cannot face them, nor can we shoot at them. So let's tackle the rotation so we can face the enemies we want to attack. To do this, we will have to actually have a reference to our game camera. We will be tracking where the player's mouse is and using the camera, we'll be able to tell how far the player is from the mouse and which direction they are facing. And that way we will calculate the angle that the player should be facing. So first let's get a component of our camera. Our camera is going to be called game camera and it's an object we will look for. So we might as well place it here instead of hard coding it like we've spoken of before. And let's connect it. So let's get our private void start. We're going to do camera is equal to game object that find. What this does is it looks into our hierarchy and looks for a game object with the provided name. This will be the name that we're looking for. And then we need to get the component from it. So we're going to get component. The component is camera and make sure to put the parentheses at the end. So we have our camera. Now what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to update the player's position in relation to that camera. So we're going to do the update function and we're going to need one more variable we're going to have a private vector position. This will keep track of our mouse's position. So we can do position mouse. Our mouse position will be equal to the camera screen world point screen to world. This is the position of the camera within the world. So whatever the camera sees, this is where it is in the coordinates. And we're going to get input mouse position. So let's just go over this again. This is saving the position of the mouse within our game. Screen to world is basically translating what the camera is looking at and where it is cardinally. Next, what we want to do is we want to create a new vector three. And this will be the position uh, difference between where the mouse is and where the player is. We can do transform that position because this will be also attached to the player character. This will, this transform is referring to the player itself. So this is subtracting where the mouse is to where the player is. From that, we will calculate our rotation. So we're going to create a float. We're going to call it rotation Z and we're going to do math F that a tan position y position x times math f that radian. So we're translating the position into an angle and then we're translating that angle into degrees. And finally, we can actually update our rotation, make that equal to a qua quaterian Euler. And then we're going to set the first two values to be zero, zero, and the last value to be our rotation minus 90 degrees. We won't get too much into this. This is higher level math uh, regarding angles and positions. Uh, just know that together, all of this will, it will get the position of the player's mouse. It will calculate the difference between the player's position and the mouse position. It will calculate the angle that that difference makes, 
and then it will save that into the player so that they're actually rotating where the mouse is pointing. Let's save that and test it. Let's make sure to add it to our player and let's test it. So as you can see, our player now is able to move around, rotate in different directions, but they are just being pushed around by the asteroids. So let's make sure our player can die when they are impacted by an object. Let's open up our player die script. To make sure that we are getting hit by something, we're going to use on collision uh, method. These are built into Unity. Uh, make sure to set it to be to 2D version, otherwise it won't, uh, otherwise it won't connect the collisions correctly. Then we're going to check the collisions tag. So we're going to check if the player is actually hitting an asteroid or something else. If the player, for example, hits the border, we don't want them to die. We want them to die only when they hit the asteroid. Uh, to do that, we will also create a variable that stores the string. We're going to call it enemy and the enemies will have an enemy tag. Our enemy asteroid has an enemy tag right here. So that's what we're going to be looking for on the collision. So let's do enemy. And then what we want to do is we want to turn off the player. So we're going to set the player to be active false. This will turn the player off and you will no longer be able to interact with it. But we also want to bring up that canvas that we saw. So what we're going to do is we're going to do public game object end panel. And what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the end panel is turned on when the player is turned off. So instead of false, we're going to say true. We're going to save it. Go back to our Unity. Look at our screen. Let's click on our player. Let's go back to our scripts. We're going to add the death script to it. Right now, you can see that there is nothing attached to our end panel. We are going to drag our end game in here and test it out. As you saw, our player now dies. The pop-up screen shows up and you can reset the game. One last thing we need to do is allow our player to shoot. So let's open up our shooting script. First things first, we will want to actually spawn our object. We will need access to the game object prefab. That's the bullet. So we're going to have a prefab. Next, we need access to a transform where we're going to parent all these game objects under. So we're going to do transform and we're going to call it bullet trash. This is where all the this is where all the prefabs will be spawned under in the hierarchy. And lastly, we need a place for the bullets to actually appear in. So we're going to have a bullet spawn. To do this, we're going to create our update method. What we're going to do is we're going to check if our player is clicking the button we want. So we're going to get key down. And the key code we're going to use is mouse zero. Mouse zero is the left mouse button on the mouse. So if the player clicks the left mouse button, we will spawn a bullet, game object, bullet, and we're going to instantiate. Instantiate means that we are creating a copy of this object that we're provided with. What we're going to do is we're going to create a copy of the prefab. We are going to create it at bullet spawn that position. And we're going to use Quartarian Identity to leave the rotation as it was. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to make the bullet transform set parent to be the bullet trash. So right now, if our player clicks the left mouse button, a bullet will spawn. Let's try this out. Let's make sure to attach it. We will need to connect these objects. So let's go to our prefab first. Let's grab our bullet. And then from our hierarchy, we will grab the trash and we will grab the spawn point. Let's test it out. So our player can spawn a bullet. However, the amount of bullets they spawn depends on how fast they click. We will want to limit the player's ability to actually do that by creating a timer that checks if they can shoot yet. So let's go back to our script. First thing we want to do is create a flag, which will be a Boolean that will check if the player can shoot. We're going to do private bool can shoot. 
we're going to set it to true. The player can always shoot at the very start of the game. However, after the player has shot, we want to make sure that they can't shoot for a given period of time. To add to that, we will have to edit this section and we're going to have to check if can shoot. If can shoot is true, the player can shoot. If can shoot is false, the player can't shoot even if they click the mouse button. Now we need to create some kind of timer that will count down until the player can shoot. We will create two new variables. We're going to have a private const float called timer. We're going to set it to half a second. And then we're going to create another one called uh, float current time. And we'll set that to half a second as well. Now what timer is, is the value that we will be resetting our current timer to. So we will count down the current timer. And when it reaches below zero, the player is given the ability to shoot again. And at that point, the current time will be reset to 0.5 seconds. Now let's actually implement that. So first, we're going to check if can't shoot. We're going to make sure that there's an exclamation mark saying that it's false. If the player cannot shoot, we will count down our current timer by saying minus equals time that delta time. Time that delta time is how much time has passed in game. So we're subtracting that from our current timer. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to check if the current time is less than zero. If it is, then we can do things. Uh, such as setting our can shoot to be true and resetting our current timer to timer. Let's save that and test it out. So our player has the ability to shoot, but they are limited uh, by a timer, so they can't spawn a million bullets at the same time. One last thing we may want to do is separate these functions. This area and this area are fairly distinct and do not interact with each other. So it will be easier to separate them and keep them organized in case you want to edit one of them. So let's create a private void and let's call it timer method. And what we can do is we can take all this code, place it in here, and we can replace it with timer method. Likewise, we can check for shooting. We can do void, player shoot. We can take all this code and we can place it in here. We're going to call it shoot since the class is called player shoot. And we're going to do shoot here. This way, you can look into your update function. You can see that first thing that happens is we check our timer and then we try to shoot. These two sections are divided and you can easily manipulate one without ever uh, interacting with the other since they are separate ideas. This will put a conclusion to this project. Feel free to experiment with it, change the visuals, create more enemies, create a large world that the player has to travel around. The world is your oyster. Make a cool game.